All right, here we are. <clears throat> the fifth week of the 2024 Soil and Nutrition Conference. Really happy this week to have Tina Owens with us. Uh, she's been in the in the food system for for quite some time. Um, you'll soon hear uh, all of her, all of her work. Um, if there's anybody who's up to speed on labeling and claims and packaging and the logistics of actually communicating nutrient levels and information to consumers and the 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 internecine not internecine the, uh, <laughs> the nuanced and complex logistics and and uh, and really important pieces of that puzzle. It's Tina. She really, really uh, has made a specialty of, of helping all the rest of us in the movement understand, you know, <laughs> how do we communicate information about nutrition on packages of food? Uh, a really, a really important piece of this broader, broader puzzle. So happy to have you with us uh, this week, Tina, and I'll just let you take it away. Thank you, Dan. I appreciate the chance to talk with you and your community today because you have also been one of the people I've learned so much from over the years. So looking forward to this conversation. Before I move into sharing some slides, I thought I would just share a bit of background about where I've been in the food system and uh, why it matters and um, how I've used that experience to be able to leverage what the regenerative agriculture or soil health movements need going forward as it relates to bringing nutrition choice to consumers on shelf. I know Dan's done a lot on this front with the biometer and uh, laboratory work and helping to educate uh, multiple stakeholders across the system. There are a lot of us out there that are translating uh, the different outcomes of soil health and nutrition for different parts of the sector and being able to work side by side with people who understand what's at stake and can help implement it further within different parts of the system, I think is incredibly important in this uh, at this place and time for the regenerative movement. So for my own part, uh, I spent two decades at two of the world's largest food companies, so 17 and a half years at Kellogg's, uh, which also owned Kashi and so several natural and organic brands. Uh, and there I worked on um, innovation uh, alongside a food scientist for the better part of five years and helping to source ingredients from all over the world for what were new and novel products. And then in 2008, I ended up in the natural and organic foods community when I joined a role at Kashi, which at the time was the largest natural and organic cereal player in the market in the US and credits itself with moving the natural uh, foods system from what they called the dusty natural food shelves at the time into mainstream retail. And it's why some of the um, large natural and organic brands uh, exist in multiple retailers across the nation today is because some of those early products actually showed the market that there was money to be had there, that there was interest from the consumer. And then it also led to the meteoric growth of places like Whole Foods and other retailers that have um, developed brands and um, product lines that are based on a values purchase from consumers. So starting in 2008, that's when I really got to know the natural and organic consumer and what it meant to eat a more healthful food life. And it started working on my own values and how I uh, looked at food and ingested food as well. Um, I had come from a background where I was raised in a, a house based on a Mother Earth news, ar news article from the mid-1970s called An Earth Sheltered Home. And my parents had raised their own goats and uh, uh, drank goat's milk and you know, harvested chickens and had a huge garden. And I'd somehow gotten away from that and uh, gone down the processed foods route. But in 2008 was when that was kind of arrested. And ever since then, I've been extracting myself from uh, that part of the food system. So uh, my claim to fame at Kashi was uh, working on uh, non-GMO, organic, and then certified transitional uh, supply chains, developing them out of thin air in some cases by working with producers and with processors to bring those things to market. And so I've been able to see what it looks like for a food company to bring small and large ingredients through the food system in ways that access consumer demand. So for example, with certified transitional, it was about allowing the consumer to go to the grocery store and purchase a product that helped pay for the transition of a farmer from conventional to organic practices. And under my watch, we um, converted 10,000 acres from conventional to organic and returned two and a half million dollars in profitability to farmers they otherwise would not have received. And I was hooked. It showed me the power of the consumer and consumer choice in helping a brand learn what's at stake, helping a retailer learn what's at stake, 
and showing farmers, um, you know, where the next market can be in helping them convert to organic practices. At the time, the uh, natural and organic industry was largely unaware of the fact that less than 1% of farmland in the U.S. was organic, and that almost the entirety of the organic sector is based on imports. That is still pretty much true. Um, while organic land has doubled since that time frame um, to being just over 1%, uh, most of the organic sector is still imported, which greatly matters for food miles and greenhouse gas emissions going forward. But that's not what we're going to talk about today. Um, after uh, working at Kashi and Kellogg's for 17 and a half years, I moved from the world's largest cereal maker to the world's largest yogurt maker and spent three and a half years at Danone North America, which had just become the world's largest B Corp, the world's largest organic company, and had made a $6 million commitment on regenerative ag conversion that was specific to dairy. And out of necessity, not out of expertise, I ended up creating one of the first regenerative finance portfolios that existed at a food company. So multiple millions of dollars in grant, philanthropic and impact investing capital to help farmers convert from conventional to regenerative practices. And ended up doing some congressional testimony on agriculture's ability, ability to help mitigate the climate crisis um, and was a media trained company spokesperson at both Kellogg's and Danone, interacting with industry folks from across the spectrum of science and regulations and policy and uh, working behind the scenes with brands on decarbonization, et cetera. Somewhere in the middle there, around 2016, as the regenerative agriculture movement was taking off in what people might call more of a mainstream view in that large companies were taking it up. I had a very meaningful conversation with Dr. Tim LaSalle, who was working at Chico State and was doing some work with Dr. Cindy Daly behind the scenes on soil carbon sequestration, but they also had some curiosity around nutrient density and started doing tests there and had initial data that showed that those two things were correlated. And I became intensely interested in this and started working my way through the sector on who was doing that research, what the outcomes were what it meant for consumer choice, where consumers knew about this, didn't know about this, where brands you know, did know about it or didn't know how to talk about it, et cetera. Um, and then four years later, uh, in the middle of the pandemic, Dan and I finally got connected. I don't know what took us so long, Dan. Um, but then um, at that point, we started talking about the work of the Bionutrient Foods Association and the Biometer um, and you know some of the other uh, lab and industry work that needed to occur in order to really bring this fully to scale as part of the regenerative movement. Having been someone who was working as a senior director of agriculture within a large food company, I also was witnessing the process in which companies were um, using, putting regenerative agriculture in this box of a procurement sourcing program as opposed to it being kind of a holistic strategy where they could engage consumers on purchase intent related to their own health uh, in ways that I had seen with Kashi, where that was a, a big driver um, in engaging consumers directly in what they wanted to see in their food system and the planet. And so I kept diving into the processes by which the food industry and marketers and decision makers within those companies are empowered or disempowered to be able to bring nutrition claims to consumers. And when I left Danone in January of 2022, um, I was very fortunate in a, finding a partnership with uh, the Soil and Climate Alliance, um, who along with the Non-GMO Project and um, Dan in the beginning as well, helped us create the Nutrient Density Alliance, which is about engaging brands in the broader community around the interest of consumers and the science and process by which consumers can choose opt into the regenerative ag movement based on an understanding of it from their own health. So we tend to talk to consumers from a place of values. And in fact, the organic and non-GMO communities talk about themselves as values-based movements when in fact they are actually science-based movements but the consumer makes their purchase through the lens of their values. And so we soft pedal our own movements sometimes by calling them values-based movements when they're actually science-based movements because we pull at the heartstrings of consumers using marketing in a way that gets them to make the choice to buy into the science-based movement. So if you find yourself doing that, I would just encourage you to be thinking of these movements as science-based. Um, because that's one of the first questions that we always get around nutrient density and regenerative agriculture is where's the science? 
Um, what's delightful about the Bionutrient Foods Association and Dan's leadership in this work um, with Dr. Stefan Van Vliet and several others is then actually, actually getting to the bottom of where the science is and that nutrient variation span, um, which I think Dan has done the best at articulating out of everybody uh, globally. So how do we take the work that is happening here at BFA and other places in the regenerative ag movement and make it so that you as the consumer can go in and opt into that product on shelf at the grocery store? And for what it's worth, right now, 68 out of the top 100 food companies on the planet have something around regenerative agriculture. Their cumulative sales are $1.3 trillion. Um, safe to say that the regenerative agriculture or soil health movement has fully arrived. Uh, and yet very little of this is actually translating into mainstream grocery store choices. Uh, for example, it's only two products that you would find nationally distributed in the US that have regenerative agriculture certifications. One is Tazo Tea, owned by Unilever, that uses the Regenerative Organic Alliance certification on some of its products. And the second is the Do Good Dog from Applegate, owned by Hormel, which uses EOV verification, but also just expanded their commitment to take their entire hot dog portfolio into regenerative agriculture, for which I commend them. Um, and they added a couple of different uh, certifications on that. Beyond that, as a consumer, you either have to know your farmer, be growing this yourself, or have access to a higher end retailer um, that is using you know, a spectrum of regenerative certifications and from brands that are probably talking to you through the lens of climate um, or through the lens of farmer practice or farmer payments, all of which are extremely valid reasons to purchase regenerative products. But that's about 15 to 20% of general consumers that purchase based on their belief system on wanting to help assist or save something outside of themselves. For the rest of us, there is 86% of US adults that have some sort of metabolic syndrome that lead to lifestyle diseases having to do with food. So it could be high cholesterol, diabetes, heart disease, cancer, um, et cetera, autoimmune. And so talking to consumers about what's in it for them, their health, their fertility, their longevity, their children's ADHD, their diabetes, reaches a much wider audience where we can talk to them about what's in it for them and not necessarily expect them to have to rise to the challenge every single time about saving something else in the planet because of their purchase. So on that note, let's talk about what we learned when we looked at the, um, the range of uh, regulatory requirements, and the need that the food industry has in being able to quantify nutrient density outcomes in their existing regenerative agriculture programs. Um, we lightly defined regenerative agriculture, so we'll talk about that in a moment, because of course it's a very hot topic within the community, uh, which I could definitely dig into that conversation if anybody wanted to. Um, and then the white paper that we created. So you'll see a lot of the focus of today's conversation through the lens of that white paper, because it was how we created a foundational set of guidelines for the broader food industry, irrespective of how large or small the player is and how they can use the existing regulatory framework to make decisions about their um, brands and how they want it to market to consumers. And actually, I was going to start off with a couple of different slides, and I jumped ahead of myself. So let's do that. Um, I have some brain-busting uh, questions that I like to ask groups. And because this is a webinar, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands or anything like that. just want you to pause on these questions uh, ahead of getting into this. Ask yourself, do you know where the word vitamin comes from? Um, the word vitamin was actually created by a biochemist, Casimir Funk, in 1912, it came from a compound called vitalamine, which then came to be shortened to vitamin. Uh, Casimir was uh, studying chickens and um, found that some leftover rice that was being given to him by the army uh, because it was waste, he was feeding that to chickens and they had a bunch of general malaise. And then the army decided that they shouldn't give that rice to him as waste anymore for the chickens. And he ended up feeding uncooked rice to the chickens. and. Lo and behold, the chickens actually had some health recovery. And Casimir wanted to know why, and because he was a biochemist, he decided to look into it. 
and found the B1 coating uh, that was around um, vitamins, uh, or around the rice rather, and that is what he named vitalamine. So um, it's been a century and a decade since we've learned how to talk about vitamins. Uh, there was a lot of science that came out in this early uh, period of the, the 1910s. And then ask yourself, when did the first multivitamin appear on the consumer market? I want you to think about this because it's been probably in the lifetime of basically everyone on this call. Um, the first one a day multivitamin appeared in 1943. Now, why does this matter? And why does it matter in relation to the conversation we're having today? It matters because the global conversation and the way that we talk about nutrition is based on science that is now a century old. Now, if you've been attending Dan's events for any period of time, you're probably well aware of how we go beyond just this simple thinking of vitamins and proteins and fats, et cetera, um, beyond the century old thinking. But there's still a lot of new science that's coming to bear that people, including um, dietitians in the nutrition industry itself, have no idea is actually about to completely change the fundamentals of the science of their industry. The reason I asked the multivitamin question is because we unconsciously, subconsciously have been programmed or marketed to for 80 years to think of supplements as a necessary part of nutrition. And that matters. It's the culture in which we were raised. It's messages that we have received anytime we go into a grocery store or elsewhere. And sometimes we just need to name that that's the environment that we've been brought up in and that we're now thinking of things the way that they've been thought about for a century in order to understand that it's time to change the page. And so as it relates to changing the page, let's break something else. Um, I want you to think about what percent of food nat nutritional bioactive compounds are tracked by the USDA. So think the side panel on products that you buy this is an Annie soil Mac from back in the day. They don't sell this anymore, but it's a fantastic example of a mainstream regenerative product. So what percent does this represent of what's in this box? 80% of the nutrition, 65% of the nutrition, 40% of the nutrition, or 1%? The answer is the USDA tracks 150 compounds. These are the compounds. The bioactive compounds, constituents of food or dietary supplements needed to meet basic human nutritional needs. And that is 1% of what science now knows is actually in the nutrition of food. You might ask, how is this possible? And maybe you've already heard this answer because you've been following Dan's work for a while. Um, but the uh, tools that were used to map human DNA and sequence human DNA, and then the human microbiome, remember about 10 years ago when we all learned we're more microbe than human, I think it was 2013 that we actually learned that. Now we um, you know, have probiotic supplements for pets. So it's come a long way in a decade. But those same tools that were mapping uh, those things at a genetic or a molecular level are being turned on the world around us. And that includes food. So Albert Laszlo Barabasi was the head of the Northeast Northeastern um, uh, physics department and is has an appointment at the Department of Medicine at Harvard Medical School. And he coined the term nutritional dark matter. Um, he has a, an article from 2019 in Nature Food, peer reviewed, that is called the unmapped chemical complexity of our diet. And in that, this is peer reviewed research, to there, he demonstrates that there are 26,000 biochemicals in food. The USDA tracks 150, I showed you on the previous slide. Ergo, we know less than 1% of what's in our food. It's actually 0.005. Since 2019, there's actually been um, peer-reviewed research showing there's between 200,000 and 300,000 biochemicals in food. And so um, that number becomes a rounding error in fairy dust. And what we actually know about nutrition when you start to blow it up to that level. And a lot of the nutrient variation work that Dan and BFA have led has been about understanding what that span is so that we can make comparisons apples to apples. But it's also about understanding the way that we think about nutrition through the lens of those 150 biochemicals so that people understand what it means for their food purchases today, like with what the biometer was scanning. So with that as the basis of the fact that this industry is changing 
the very ground that it stands on is changing with scientific validity. Um, let's talk about the base of what the existing food system process can be used today to talk about nutrient density outcomes and where the barriers are, what it means for consumer choice, how big movements like food as medicine might or should tie in to nutrient density outcomes, and then where the consumer's at on this, because the consumer is pretty clear on the value proposition of nutrition, and they are starting to understand inherently, especially the younger generations, that the way something is grown matters not only for the planet, but for their own health um, and uh, ongoing health with that of their family. Now, as I jump in to talk about the white paper, uh, which is kind of the basis of this conversation for the next few slides, you may want to take a look at it just to see for yourself what we cover, which would also help with any questions that you might want to ask about this. And as Dan pointed out to me earlier, um, some of you are not from the U.S. And so while this is through the basis of the FDA, the Federal uh, Food, sorry, Food and Drug Administration, or the USDA, the U.S. Um, Department of Agriculture, the two uh, entities that um, measure and manage uh, our food system and how things are claimed on PAC. Uh, you can apply this way of thinking around regulatory processes to your own um, country because most all countries are talking about nutrition in the same way. So that's one of the reasons that I showed that century old thinking is because this is the structure, vitamins, proteins, minerals, fat, that the entire um, global system of regulations is using and how to talk about nutrition and food. And so um, while we might not have the links to your regulating agency, you could do that research on your own front and find out if you have similar barriers on your end that need to be dealt with in order to bring through regenerative agriculture and nutrient density outcomes for consumers. So hopefully I lingered there long enough for everybody to be able to grab that QR code and go out to the uh, white paper um, essentially, the Nutrient Density Alliance saw that consumers are purchasing for taste, health, quality, and nutrition. Meanwhile, those of you that have followed soil health and nutrition outcomes for any period of time know that the regenerative agriculture movement at large offers taste, health, quality, and nutrition, and yet there's a gap. They've forgotten to engage consumers. So we looked at that gap and said, how do we fix that? The contributing members that we have as a part of the process review included laboratories and brands and nonprofits, both big and small, who have had some stake in the game around academic research, um, laboratory processes, uh, food certifications like the Non-GMO project, uh, or our uh, ingredient suppliers into really large companies or our large companies themselves. And so this was about looking at each different viewpoint of the regulatory process whether you're a lab like WiseCode, whether you're an ingredient supplier like Anchor Ingredients, or whether you're WK Kellogg Company, which now owns Kashi, and are taking that on pack to consumers. And we established um, for our industry uh, an example of the aggregated science around the link between soil and nutrition. So what's really interesting is I stood on stage at Expo East last fall, I think it was September, and asked in front of a room of my peers of a couple of hundred people um, who manage natural and organic brands and a lot of regenerative uh, ag, you know, members of the community are in that space as well at that food show, asked how many of them knew that soil health and nutrition were linked. And the only hands that went up in the audience were that of my team members. And so there's a lot of work to do fundamentally for the natural, organic and regenerative communities to help the brand leads, the C CEOs, the C-suites, the chief sustainability officers, all of them understand that these things are actually linked in a way that they can pull forward meaningfully for their brand. And to be able to move that system, understanding its you know, flaws and strengths from inside out is the best way to help uh, people understand their own business case and move it forward. So within the white paper, we tackled three really big things um, the first I just mentioned that communities are unaware of the link between soil health and nutrition. And if the natural, organic, and regenerative communities are unaware, how much more is the conventional food system unaware? Uh, the regenerative brands are not aware of the deep consumer interest in this topic, which has been measured and can be talked about with specificity. 
And how do we use, this is the key, how to use existing food system processes to bring through any measurable regenerative nutrition outcomes to consumers so that brands can talk about it from a leadership position and show others that that potential is there. Now, I'm going to use some industry jargon, like segregated supply here, but I'm also going to try and make sure that I'm talking about it in a way that is helpful for um for lay people that are uh, on the page or are part of the webinar. So on the page, we have in the upper right-hand corner, a um, snapshot of the type of existing regenerative agriculture certifications as generally agreed to by the regenerative ag community in the US. That's even a controversial statement in itself, but let's leave it there. Um, and because we know that this is a matter of vast debate, on how regenerative agriculture is defined. We said, if you have third-party validation from a certification that is known to be in the regenerative community, or at the very least have an agronomic service that is measuring your soil organic matter outcomes, the key being that you've got a third party saying that you are doing regenerative practices that are leading to soil organic matter that can be correlated to nutrition outcomes. Um, that that is the basis upon which each brand should make the decision about whether or not they have an outcome in nutrition to take to consumers. So once again, do I have a third party certification I'm already working with, um, such as the ones on the upper right hand side? Or do I at minimum have an agronomy service that is providing and measuring soil organic outcomes? Um, and I can make truthful statements on PAC about what it means for nutrition, um, because the FTC, the Federal Trade Commission in the U.S. will also uh, could also uh, litigate any greenwashing claims if you're making claims that you can't actually back up. So we are asking the question, if it's true that I have uh, a third party certification that's working with me on my regenerative practices, and I take some representative sampling. I, I take a few of those samples and I send them to a laboratory and find that of the standard nutrition called out on a nutrition facts panel. So I have the example here, just like I showed you on the side of the box. If I have um, better uh, fiber or higher protein, for example, and I can correlate that back, not necessarily to the varietal, but to the practices in which that um, product was grown, do I have the ability to take all of that and put it into a product and talk about it? So let's talk about a specific example here. There are several different regenerative wheat farmers who have talked specifically without talking to each other about testing their regenerative wheat and finding 40% higher protein. Well, you know, going back to Annie Soil Mac, and poor Annie, they have nothing to do with this conversation. They just make a great example. You know, this is mostly wheat. It's pasta, right? So what if that regenerative wheat with the higher protein actually allowed you as the consumer to pick it up and look at it side by side with a competitor and see that it had more protein and know that that's something you want to eat or you want your child to eat? Wouldn't that be meaningful to take all of that wheat through its own supply shed. So it's going in its own grain bins, it's going in its own processing chamber, it's coming out in its own bags, and then it's going in the finished product and you can follow it all the way through segregated volume and charge the consumer uh, a premium for doing so because that does not come without cost. The certification itself also comes with a cost and engage consumers on that very point. And how much of a difference would that make for brands to know that they could actually have that conversation with consumers? So, you know, if I'm a regenerative organic certified product and I'm doing that segregation anyway, because I have to, in order to get that certification on my box, then I already have a segregated volume. And what I would need to do is do a representative sampling program so um, a scientific process by which the number of samples that I do are relevant to the total size of the lot. And if I could create my own nutrition facts panel based off of that information, because I'm working with a laboratory that that is their job, that is their business, it's what they do. And they've advised me that I have those outcomes and I have the scientific proof. Then I can use the existing ingredient specification 
and certificate of analysis process to create the side panel. So an ingredient specification is a piece of paper that says for the regenerative wheat, here is the size of the grain, and the moisture and the ash and the protein and the key things that I need this grain to uh, include if I'm going to take it into my production facility and have it match with plus or minus 20% accuracy to what's on my side panel. Okay, so I can be 120% of these nutrition facts or I can be 80% of these nutrition facts. Either way, I'm within the funnel that the USDA and FDA allow, USDA in this case, um, for me to make a claim to have this on my side panels nutrition facts if I'm plus or minus 20% within that range. The certificate of analysis process is what accompanies every single shipment of that wheat saying we matched the specification, we matched the specification, so that those who manage quality and the nutrition of the ingredients in the production facility can show that that product is actually meeting what they have on the side panel, and that's how the regulatory process is upheld. Um, I say this is in place of secondary USDA data because the USDA has a central system um, called Food Data Central, where they actually provide nutrition facts for a blueberry or for wheat or for chicken. And we don't have to go through the process of um, laboratory sampling for every single product to understand nutrition. If we want to, we can default to the existing USDA data. And in fact, most brands, and especially small brands who can't afford the representative sampling program actually just use the USDA standard data. So if my competitor's using the USDA standard data, or previously I used the USDA standard data, and I'm now doing representative sampling and show that I have 40% higher protein, and I'm within the regulations to put that on my package, I can now make a comparison to what is standard within the industry and that 40% higher protein because I have proven through my testing process that I have met and complied with the paper work trail, the representative sampling, the laboratory process, and the side panel process in order to take that to consumers. I know it sounds dry. This is how every single box of everything you've ever bought <laughs> gets determined and put on shelf. Now, in order to get brands to fully buy into doing this, it's not just going to the nutrition person and saying, hey, can you run this paperwork? There's actually three different um, departments within large companies, especially, who all have to agree that there is a nutrition claim there. Otherwise, you'll never even get a blog post or something on the website, let alone something on PAC which is highly regulated, right? And so marketing can't just say, oh, well, I did this. And so therefore my nutrition must be higher because look, I have this regenerative certification. So we're just going to go ahead and say it's higher. That's not how it works. The marketer might be the one leading the new product because it is key to the portfolio to get a retailer involved or for a key consumer need because marketing is the one that identifies those needs in most cases and develops what the product, uh, new product might be. But quality and nutrition are usually departments within large companies that manage how a grain is defined, which grain they're sourcing, what it means from a protein or nutrition perspective, and what it means to have something come into the production facility that is that plus or minus 20% that I talked about. And so if it's outside that window, they have to run a calculation to see, am I even within the regulatory scope of being at least 80% accurate at all times? Um, and then they issue the specification on what the wheat should be, the varietals, um, the size of the lots, what type of sampling should happen. They issue that upstream to the ingredient suppliers. And then there's legal departments in every company or companies uh, purchase outside legal and regulatory review. It could be from a laboratory where they're looking at the regulatory process for how you put something on a package and ensuring that it's in compliance. So Wise Code was on the page earlier. They're a member of the Nutrient Density Alliance. They have a laboratory that does measurements on nutrient outcomes for the food system. 
Um, they're part of a process that a lot of food companies use. They can provide regulatory and legal guidance on whether or not the representative sampling and outcomes that they performed on the wheat did in fact show 40% higher protein and can be put on fat. Now to help these three departments understand how to work with one another and what they need to align on, that was actually what we honed in on in the white paper. Because again, if you can't get marketing to get, if marketing can't get approval from quality and nutrition or from regulatory and legal, it doesn't exist. It will not even be on a Facebook post, let alone on PAC. Um, so we called out what the pivotal department leaders were, um, how we could enable each of those teams to make their decisions based on what their own purview is and understanding the process. And we also understood that marketers are likely shying away from talking about complicated soil science or climate science on PAC. Furthermore, we all know that that's a polarizing topic and large brands especially, but also small brands that are looking to grow don't necessarily want to alienate somebody because they're talking about science, science, climate science. For soil science, there's a bunch of marketers who are like, if I talk about dirt on the package, consumers will think the food is dirty. Um, that was one of the first quotes I actually got from a marketer in relation to this, by the way. And it's been a, um, a fallacy in thinking that has been repeated across multiple stakeholders uh, in the six or eight years since I first heard that. So we also had to arm marketers with a way to talk about this that was not packaging and making sexy soil science or climate science because that's not how all consumers work. So we created a nutrient density outcomes project checklist. This is an extensive checklist. It's rather full and it takes you from how to confirm the availability of the type of wheat with higher protein all the way through how you would launch and which of the departments need to be involved, et cetera. And so if you're working from within a company as a change agent and you need help understanding how to create the business case for your brand to determine that you have a claim or don't have a claim, I hope that this is a worthwhile tool for you to take a look at and understanding what to do internally to get alignment across each of these different departments that are likely going to be part of the decision-making process for your project and focusing in on these three. So that, what else did we talk about in the white paper? Um, there are, can, there's, so we went into specific barriers. There's four barriers, really fallacies and mindsets that the industry was just kind of predisposed to. It's like a bowling ball. You'd see their, their, them head towards uh, that part of the, of the lane every single time because the, of the way that we thought about nutrition and the way that um, we have uh, decoupled the link between soil health and nutrition. And so we found these four fallacies coming up a lot. One is confusion about how higher nutritional outcomes are quantified. And um, so there were people who were saying, you know, do we need to go to human health trials uh, to talk about the fact that there's 40% higher protein in wheat? And, you know, it sounds maybe plausible until you realize that when you do a granola bar and you add some more soy to have a higher protein claim, you don't need to go to human health trials. So why would you need to do so for an ingredient that just has superior nutrition? And so we talk about how the same systems that already exist get people thinking about the process. This is the process you already use. And here is how you can use the already existing process to do the same thing you already do in the food system today. Um, barrier number two, I'm sure Dan's gotten this a lot, is the invariably the first question is, where's the science? Like how, I've never heard that nutrition and soil health are linked. How can this be possible? If it was true, I would already know about it, right? That fallacy of thinking, if it was true, I'd already know about it. And so we found that we needed to um, go to quite a high level on the um, scientific consensus around soil health and nutrient density being linked. And because we had really large CPG, large food company stakeholders, um, that we kind of needed to go to what they would have viewed as, you know, some of the highest credentials and scientific authority. So we ended up focusing quite a lot on the year of the soils from 2015 and the work of the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization, because they, in a decade ago now, created extensive information linking soil health and nutrient density. And they also talk about how nutrient deficient soil equals nutrient deficient foods, which equals nutrient deficient people, and that that actually leads to things like hidden hunger. 
And hidden hunger is when your food's not giving you enough nutrients and your eat signal does not turn off. And it leads to obesity because you're actually overeating because your food doesn't have enough nutrients. And so all of this had been laid out 10 years ago. And then there was existing science that we could show that bolted onto that to show that the confluence of science was actually all leading to the same place, that soil health and nutrient density are absolutely linked. And that there's enough science in the academic and research space to justify individual companies working to push this into the for-profit space and engage consumers on it, even though we didn't have standardized metrics as an industry. And then in fact, we would have to take it to consumers and have a bunch of brands working on what this meant and how to test for it in order for there to be um, consensus within the for-profit food space. Um, barrier number three was believing that additional studies needed to be uh, done before taking action. And so we acknowledge there's always more research that can happen. Um, you know, Dan has continued to lead a lot of research that continues to deepen people's understanding of how real this topic is. And so that always is true that there's more research that can be done, um, but that there was enough for the industry to take this seriously um, and to start talking with consumers about it. And then finally, I mentioned the barrier number four about marketing complicated soil science to engaging consumers. So I'm not gonna cover that again. People also didn't quite know where to look. If they weren't just using the Food Data Central database at the USDA, which is in the upper right-hand corner here, by the way, um, they didn't know where else they needed to go and what regulations they needed to follow. And we, we definitely told them you should be talking to a laboratory that's ISO accredited and that works in the food industry and understanding and already advising on side panel nutrition um, so that they understand already the inherent regulations on this. Um, but here is all of the different uh, data and information and resources from regulatory bodies that you at least need to know about and take into account. So you'll see FTC green guides on truth and advertising related to oversight of environmentally friendly claims. There are regulatory guidance on how all of this actually can go unpack. And then we talked about which strategies um, to use over multiple crop years and what to do if you're a small brand, what to do if you're a large brand, what to do if it's too expensive to segregate volume, um, you know, whether you should be talking about it with consumers if you can't segregate volume. Uh, and essentially, if you can't take all of that wheat with a 40% higher protein and put it into a finished product, you should not be talking about nutrient density tied to soil health on pack because you don't actually have that product in the box. So, um, you know, helping brands make each of those decisions. We went with an ISO accreditation as a baseline for laboratory guidance because that's best practice within the food system, especially with large food companies. That's a minimum standard that they require for any um, laboratory processes and those certificates of analysis that show up with every um, lot that, that shows up at a production facility to be made into something like cereal. And then we answer frequently asked questions. A big one that comes up, this is the only one I'll go into here, is what about crop variability? You know, and this is a very relevant question. Regenerative nutrition, um, you know, related to those practices, it, it can differ based on rainfall, um, you know, um, uh, based on varietals, et cetera. And what we pointed out is, well, that already exists. And so if you, you know, companies are already mixing lots in order to meet a specific target again for that plus 20 or minus 20, 80% compliance to the nutrition label. And so this is not a new question. We just need to take the existing process and think about how it would apply here. Now that said, if I've taken my wheat that has 40% higher protein and I've segregated and put it in a box and then the next year my protein's only 30% higher, I'm gonna to have to reprint my package. Um, and that's an expense that I need to account for. And so this is a decision-making process uh, from a cost-benefit analysis of whether or not it's worth it for me to do that or not. Now, what still needs to be tackled? This is probably going to be one of the more interesting conversation pieces for everybody here, because this is the part that doesn't get talked about. So what we uncovered as part of the white paper was where we could not make regulatory guidance on how to um, refer to something or make claims about something that had a regenerative nutrition outcome. Um, so one thing to note is that Food Data Central, that USDA standard nutrition um, 
you know, the, where I can go and just pull a nutrition facts panel. If I, even if I have 10 ingredients of my cereal, I can just go pull all 10 of those from food data central, and put them on my box and boom, I'm, I've matched the regulations. Uh, the sample size of that is actually small. And so for blueberries, for example, I think there's six or eight samples um, that the USDA bases that nutrition of a blueberry on. Well, if Dan and I owned a field of blueberries that's 10 acres wide, and we had to do our own representative sampling of that 10 acre blueberry field, we would have to pull more than six or eight samples to be able to do our own nutrition panel. So the um, representative sample of what the USDA bases their nutrition on is something like, you know, six bananas, eight blueberries, uh, different, um, you know, lots from around the US, but still it's a very small sample set. More specifically, what we found is that on um, non-animal products, um, so things like that wheat that I mentioned, if the wheat has 40% higher protein, the Federal Grain Inspection Service, which is within the USDA, has a standard definition of what is wheat. And so if somehow I had a higher protein level than what the USDA and FGIS said is wheat, technically I'm outside of the regulation. And so I would need to look at whether or not my regenerative nutrition is actually pushing me out of the bounds of what my own government considers to be the standard identity of wheat. And, you know, it may or may not matter. I mean, we have those standard definitions for trade. We certainly want to adhere to regulations no matter what. Um, but I would probably have to go to the FGIS and ask for a variance if I technically wanted to be all the way in compliance because my wheat actually scored with higher nutrition than what FGIS considers to be the standard of identity of wheat. That matters. That's a smaller portion of what I'm about to say as it relates to animal proteins. Animal proteins would be eggs, dairy, chicken, beef, you know, pork, you name it, right? All animal proteins. On pack nutrition labeling for animal products is so standardized that you as a consumer cannot walk into a um, retailer and purchase anything that is differentiated in the nutrition facts panel. This is the guidance from the Food Safety and Inspection Service on how to label for meat products. They have beef and veal, pork and lamb, chicken and turkey. Here's where the, you know, hopefully you can see the site down at the bottom. But they treat beef as beef as beef, chicken as chicken as chicken. And so, for example, this is the guidance on chicken and turkey. These are the numbers. If you're going to put a nutrition facts panel, which you're required by law, on your chicken, this is what you're putting. If it was pasture raised and you have a higher omega-3-6 fatty acid ratio or a lower and more, more balanced rather omega-3-6 fatty acid ratio, you might be able to make a claim on what's called front of pack, um, which is actually regulated by the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, but it will not change anything you can put on the nutrition facts panel. Furthermore, those that we talked to that have animal proteins currently in the system, especially small regenerative brands that are owned by really large corporations, said that um, they're not able to call out the differences in the nutrition for the pastured animal that they have because there is no regulatory guidance to do so. The regulatory guidance is treat them all the same. And furthermore, this data that's down here in the left-hand corner, chicken and turkey, I have been told by someone within that very large system with a lot of legal and regulatory expertise that this is based on 1990 standards. Um, does anyone want to think about what's changed in poultry since 1990? All the varietals that we're using as far as the breeding of chicken, um, how the chickens are raised, how they're confined, what they're fed as far as um, food waste from the rest of the food system, whether or not GMOs exist within that system because they did not exist pre-1990. Basically, every single thing about the way that we raise poultry has changed since 1990, 34 years ago. That's what this nutrition for chicken is based on, if my what I've been given as guidance um, is accurate. And so if that's true, then 
our, we've changed the entire structure of how that animal is raised, but not acknowledged the different nutritional outcomes related to that. Uh, this guidance that I was given said that the conventional chicken is actually scoring about 30% below this. Their regenerative chicken was scoring just above. And so when you compare it to what the USDA requires you to label for, it doesn't look like it's that much different. But when you do the testing on what's actually in the food system that everybody's eating that's labeled like this, it's 30% below. And so then you can see the spread, right? Um, and that's why this inherently matters is that once again, you as a consumer are not able to go into a grocery store and make an informed decision based on agricultural production practices to know what the nutrition outcomes are for animal proteins, unless it's something like the omega-3-6 fatty acid ratio, which once again is a front of pack claim by FDA. They're not impacting any of these side panel nutrition facts. Once you understand that all of that data is less than 1% based on 30 year old production processes and doesn't differentiate between agricultural production systems, as uh, some of my recent nutritional friends have told me, um, it begs a lot of questions about how we fundamentally talk about nutrition. And it's one of the reasons I started this talk and, and um, showing you that the conversation, the way we've been talking about this is a century old now. If ever there was an uh, industry ripe for disruption, ripe for moving forward on processes, ripe for understanding what it meant for human health in this moment, this is it. Now, this means for food is medicine, because a lot of you know that this very much matters for human health outcomes. And I apologize, I know there's 22 comments in the chat and I will definitely get to them. Uh, that'll be in the next segment. Um, but food is medicine. So food is medicine is just getting started. And as you likely know, poor nutrition is the leading driver of death and disability and in all of just the diseases I mentioned here. 86% of US adults actually have metabolic syndrome or outright one of these diagnoses like um, obesity, hypertension, et cetera. This is the state of our healthcare in the US. The economic costs of that diet, of our suboptimal diet, lead to $1.1 trillion in healthcare and lost productivity costs per year, which is equivalent to the economic output of the entire food sector. We are spending just as much in chronic and ill health as we are spending on that health, uh, on that food with suboptimal diets. That is why this nutrition work matters so greatly. Um, and then according to SPINS, which tracks your point of purchase data, so these are the things you actually put in your grocery cart and actually paid for, um, combined with consumer sentiment, 66% of Americans are now choosing products based on personal health needs. Well, I wonder why 86% of us are chronically ill. Um, this is from the True Cost of Food, Food is Medicine case study. It was published, I believe, in September of last year. There was a global study published in January of this year that shows that the global cost of this is $10 trillion. Ill health, poor nutrition, and the cost of the healthcare system, and that these are absolutely avoidable costs, and that we should be investing in this as a society and globally because it matters greatly for how we can even have economic viability and growth in the future, let alone health for generations. Um, where do consumers sit on this? I promised some consumer data. Uh, one of the reasons I dug in so deeply on nutrient density for the past eight years is that nutrient density is the regen ag shortcut to consumer demand. So we've talked about health and brands and where everybody's at. Um, what's really interesting is that the organic consumer, and this is US-based research, so apologies to those that you, of you that are international, um, in 2020, the organic consumer, which is 82% of households purchase one or more organic product a year. They were the original stakeholders to say soil health was a unifying factor in their purchase of organic across the drivers of better flavor, better nutrition, and better ecology. So that's where you could start to see that those things were being melded, linked in the consumer mind. And what's really interesting about this that I learned quite well during my Kashi days at Kellogg, is that that organic consumer tends to be the tip of the spear. They go first in the um, 
food sector with their values, et cetera. And then the rest of the consumer movement kind of follows behind them, depending on what they can afford. So that gave way to the organic movement, gave way to the non-GMO movement, which gave way to the clean label movement, um, which gave way to like the short label, right? If you can't pronounce it, if it's got more than seven ingredients, what have you, whatever arbitrary number, um, that organic consumer has been at the front wave of that. And so it mattered in 2020 that this is what they started saying their belief was in relation to their purchase of organic. And each of these came after that. Um, so you can read the slide yourself. I won't go through all of them, but there's two I want to point out. One is 2023 Gen Z has embraced the idea from Hartman Group that more intentional production methods lead to food and beverages that are not only healthier and tastier, but better for the community and the planet. This is what the younger generations now inherently understand to be true. And while they may not have the dollar spend that some of the older consumer segments have, they will come into the purchase and demand for these products much earlier in their lives because they will have problems getting pregnant. I don't know if you've looked at global fertility, it's fallen off a cliff. Um, so has uh, nutrient gaps. And we're all walking around with some level of nutrient deficiency, um, almost every single one of us. And so where millennials had to become parents and feed their kids in order to become organic consumers, Gen Z already inherently understands that these things are linked and that it matters how they eat if they want to be healthy. And since it might be a choice between what you buy at the grocery store and $50,000 a pop, uh, you know, fertilization uh, in vitro IVF treatments, um, I'm going to go on record as saying that there's probably a lot of them who are, would rather not go in debt and will instead rework their diet around nutrient density and health outcomes. The last one I'll highlight on this page is that 86% of younger natural shoppers and a good section of older and conventional shoppers believe that organic and regenerative farming can help improve the nutrient density of our foods. This is from the Non-GMO Project. It's work that occurred just in, um, it was uh, published just in January of this year. I know Megan Westgate, the executive director and founder of the Non-GMO Project, is going to be part of this series. And so that's the only point of that research that I pulled out because I know that she will go into it in more detail. But consumers do understand and are highly interested in the link between soil health and their own health. So again, the white paper, just in case you didn't have a chance to scan the QR code earlier, here it is. Um, it outlines how Regen Ag offers clear consumer-centric narratives for brands based on taste, health, quality, nutrition. Brands already know all their consumer data is built around, do my consumers buy for taste? Do they buy for health? Do they buy for quality? Do they buy for nutrition? And so it puts it in these standard frames of reference that marketers know how to talk about and that their brands already have considerable data showing them as part of the purchase value of their product as they bring it to market. And with that, oh boy, I see 30 uh, things going on in the chat, 31. <laughs> and so we're gonna dive into, dive into that together. Um, and I will also uh, put our Nutrient Density Alliance website uh, in the chat in case anybody wants to reach out there. Dan, should I check in with you First, I think I accidentally stopped my video. Should I check in with you first about the theme of the chat or should I jump in? How do you want to handle this? Yeah, well, we'd like to um, <clears throat> spend the next half hour just you and me and Carolyn and Irwin and just sort of the panelists uh, discussing what you've what you've brought up and then we'll spend the last half hour on the Q&A. I think mostly the, the, the comments in the chat box are between people and each other, um, to each other, but the the... the Anybody who's got questions for for you to respond to, um, they generally put them in the Q and A. So we've got eight in there right now. Great. Um, but uh, Carolyn, are you able to to unmute and turn your camera on? And Erwin, I see Hi, Carolyn. Hi. Hey, hey, how are we doing? <laughs> I'd <laughs> Fine. Love, I'd love to get Carolyn on if she can. If she's a represents a a company in this space and I think I'd love to hear her her comments. <clears throat> uh, maybe we'll give her give her one second to do that. I've I've got a, a bunch of a bunch of things I've jotted down I'd love to sort of um dig into. But Erwin, any any comments from your side as a as a farmer and um you know <laughs> just just a small <laughs> one because uh I, I heard this before that in uh, in the States um Demeter and also organic is easily aligned with our uh, with regenerative and um, and the contrary here in Holland uh, also uh, Demeter and so for the biodynamic 
and uh, Organic Alliance, they um, stepped back from regenerative and they wrote this big paper in which they say we are not regenerative because all this big food corporations use the term and they say no we are the real deal but we are not regenerative and we're just organic and biodynamic and um, i'm wondering how is that different in the us because i saw it under the brands of uh, as a, an example of regenerative um, brands or um, how do you say certifications what's your yeah. view on that tina um, I can provide a little bit of perspective, but this gets to some of the, I would say, tensions between the conventional regenerative system, the organic sector, and the organic regenerative sector in the U.S. Mm. And so um, regenerative organic certification and Demeter both require organic certification at their base. And then it's additional um, audits and certification beyond organic. Yeah. And, um, you know, in the U.S., I mentioned less than 1% of farmland is actually organic. So for us, if you were to only focus on those organic acres and look at regenerative, you would be working with a very small base. And we actually mm. need to move those in the center. I also mentioned that 68 of the top 100 food companies have something around regenerative agriculture, which is why the debate is heating up so quickly, because some of them are defining it only through the lens of what their farmers are willing to do, like cover yeah. crops, crop rotation, yeah. no and low till, maybe Just not even animal or manure mm -hmm. integration, right? And so I would call that the on-ramp, right? And we've got to be able to move people between what is the North Star in the system, which I would call Demeter and ROC uh, as, you know, what's possible organic plus plus when you're looking at all the spectrum. But the organic sector has also recently in the U.S., um, started talking about organic as regenerative because they believe that the regenerative community is potentially, and in the especially in the conventional space, might be taking shelf space or taking premiums mm. that otherwise would have gone to organic farmers. Mm. And I very much understand those market dynamics and why they would um, feel, uh, you know, some sense of tension with that part of the system. What I ask of my fellow community members in that case is to look at the overall climate change mitigation potential rather than focusing on arguing about shelf space. Because what regenerative agriculture is intended to do at scale is about mitigating climate and changing mindsets of farmers to focus on soil health. And so whether you're a conventional farmer coming to the basic practices of regenerative that teach you soil biology and help you understand that it is a living organism to be fed and nurtured in a way that leads you to understand the value of the organic sector, that to me is a win. Um, only focusing on organic farmers globally and adding regenerative practices onto that is not going to be enough for climate change mitigation. So it's it's a I very so controversial yeah. topic for sure. I probably yeah. didn't yeah. answer your question, and I probably just further dimensionalized what you're talking about <laughs> yeah. as far as the the different I know there, there's approaches. There, yeah. there are also here in the Netherlands a lot of discussions about it, and um, you know, as I see my fellow uh, biodynamic colleagues, but also my organic colleagues, they're still they're thinking they're doing so much for soil health, but still they're mostly thinking about killing, you know, killing weeds yeah. and killing yeah. insects. Yep. Um, and then not really bringing life. Yeah, they have a cover crop for soil structure, but they could do so much more with that. Yeah. Because it's not it's not a checklist. It, it is really understanding the, the complex system and, and managing that and bringing life. And and as long as then they're not doing that, that I think it's wise they step down from regenerative here <laughs> because they're not. And you know, we are um, in this small regenerative community and, and it's half conventional farmers and half organic farmers. And those are the nice ones, you know, Th those want to bring life to their farms. And I learn as much from the conventional ones as from the organic ones. Yep. And and that, that's a nice interchange. But this segregation of organic and conventional, it's, it's, it's not good. It's unnatural. Yeah, it's not helpful for people who want to or might eventually move out of base, basic regenerative practices into organic for them to feel like yeah. it's an exclusive crowd, right? And so no, exactly. um, what I've said recently to the organic community, because I was at um, one of the recent convenings, is that we need to stop kicking the scaffolding out from underneath people who are trying to raise the floor just because we're busy trying to raise the ceiling. Yeah, And so you've got to, the, I think the organic sector, at least in the U.S., has hit a ceiling because, and they can't go any further because the bottom of the system hasn't been able yeah. to come up. And so until you raise that, 
you're not able to build to even more heights without it feeling further polarizing because you've those who aren't part of your system, you've made it to feel exclusive. Yeah. So I think there's a lot of mindset shifts that need to happen there. And it's definitely an ongoing conversation across all the different factions of regenerative. I will say what everybody has in common is the practices of cover crops, crop rotation, no and no till or animal and manure integration. We're essentially keeping living cover in the soil and treating soil as a living organism. That's a mindset shift that so many producers need to go through instead of what can I kill today, right? Which is the yeah. prevailing mindset. And that in itself is enough of a shift to be fighting for. And so wherever we can help people make that shift, they will automatically start coming closer to what an organic uh, market might offer for them. There's a, a, a producer in the state of Indiana here, um, Rick Clark, who's well known in the regenerative space and actually was featured mm -hmm. in the recent Common Ground film. And he has 7,000 acres under regenerative management. He was about 10 or 12 years into his regenerative conversion when he recognized that he was actually an organic farmer, just not getting the double premium because he had so convinced himself that organic was for somebody else and that he didn't want anything yeah. to do with it because of the way the sector acted. We can't afford to have people go a decade, you know, operating under the practices that actually support organic, but not wanting anything to do with it because of how the community has behaved. That's just not acceptable exactly. in my book. Yeah. Dan, great you perspective. To Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> What's that, Tina? Oh, I was just gonna say, where, where do you want to go from here? Well, I want to, I want to sort of tease apart some of the, I just want to review some of the points you brought up, which I think are really important and, and, and bear emphasis, but then, you know, uh, dig into a couple corollary implications um i i mean you were talking a bit about protein um you know in, in the in the 40 percent and what you can say and the fsis and the well, i've got wrote it down fgis and fsis and and all those <laughs> uh things um <clears throat> but then you said you know of the that's one compound that's or nutrient that's that's you know uh, um delineated on the side of pack out of out of eight or ten that is uh, out of 150 that the USDA monitors that, you know, I think it was Barabasi's quote was 26,000 and then uh, compounds in food. And then you said somebody else had come up with a 250,000 different compounds in food. And who was it? Was it Wise Code that was said that was doing the work with that was looking at? at um, I think it was. Soybeans. And I they know I made this in the, my the black pepper and the, and the soybeans. Who was it? That was yeah, I know with? I saved this in my, oh no, um, black pepper in the, that was um, bright seed. Bright seed, bright seed. Yep, so but they, uh, Wise Code was the one that actually had the published research, I think, um, on the 200 to 300,000 compounds. And so right. I'll try and find that in the background here if I can, without being too distracting. Um, so I can put it in the chat for everybody just so they can see how the science progressed from 2019 till, you know, last year, I think was when that was published. Mm -hmm. Well, it, it seems a lot like the sort of the Human Genome Project or the National Microbiome Initiative when you start out thinking there's a couple of genes and then, or a couple of microbes in the soil and then it's, oh, it's a thousand, oh, it's 10,000, oh. Yeah. But it was it was Bright Seed, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, that said, you know, based on what they had found in black pepper and soybeans and a couple other crops, if they projected out into all crops, they projected there was over 10 million different compounds in food. And so, you know, I think, you know, this begs the question or emphasizes the point of what we see on the pack. And, you know, you walk us through how difficult it is, you know, to change the numbers on a package and the legal requirements and the hassle and assessment and everything else. Um, or you could just use a number they give you, which is not in tune. But, you know, to the question of what is nutrient density, and I think <clears throat> there's a there's the food science definition of nutrient density, which is one that's been around for many decades, which I think I referenced when I presented a couple of weeks ago, which is that, you know, kale has a certain nutrient density and rice has a certain nutrient density and um, Coca-Cola has a certain nutrient density. And it's based on the average nutrients per calorie uh, in that food. So kale, not having many calories is more nutrient dense than rice. So that's the historical, um, if food science definition of the term as similarly as an organic used to mean in organic chemistry any compound which contains carbon and subsequently there's been a social movement which you know didn't co-opt the word but basically created a new word for a new a new meaning for organic so that it means 
some things to the general consumer and some things to 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 chemists. Um, and and we're I think in the midst of that process now with the term nutrient density. So, um, yeah, I just I, I'm just wondering. Um, you know, we've been framing it as the <clears throat> the overall functional quality of that wheat, uh, you know, in relation to other wheat. Um, you've been framing it here with the Nutrient Alliance as as this one nutrient is higher or lower. It, it seems like there's they're, they're actually quite different um, intentions or 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 um, uses of the word, but we're both we're using it similarly. Yeah. I think there may be some cognitive dissonance there. So. Um, well, I'm not sure. I think it's the difference between the old system or what the system understands today and where the system's headed, Dan. Okay. And you're, so, you're ahead of the curve. Well, <laughs> or off the, <laughs> off the, off the, off the, off the deep end. But, but it, can you, can you, can you elaborate on that point? Because I think there is, <clears throat> yeah. it, there is some diff cognitive dis dissonance, I would say, in people trying to tease out what we're talking about and what it means and, and. Yeah. And, and for your part, the nutrient, the span of nutrient variation as an understanding of nutrient density, I think is much more useful in our understanding of food and conversation. But unfortunately, none of the regulatory processes or how we talk about food unpack have caught up to that level of viewpoint, right? And yeah. so it's teaching people how to use the current definition and understanding of, you mentioned kale, having more nutrients um, versus calories as, you know, kind of the standard definition that everyone's using. And so when you're trying to lead people into something that's entirely new, I find it's best to start with what they know and then add on to it, which is one of the reasons I also started today by breaking, right? How long have we been talking about nutrition this way? Over a century, maybe it's time for an update. We're not even at the rotary phone level. If we're still, you know, we're back at the telegraph level of nutrition when we're yeah. talking about it the same way Casimir and his cohort talked about it in 1912, 1913. We haven't moved beyond that yeah. on pack. And in the general sphere and in everything that dietitians and health professionals are taught today about nutrition, they're all still talking about it the way Casimir talked about it. Um, where we're headed, as you know, and are, are part of the forefront of this work, is that molecular mapping of food, which includes not only the caloric intake and nutrient outcome of something like kale, but may in fact include, if you're mapping food at a parts per billion level, it's not just nutrient density, it's pathogens pesticides, allergens, and adulteration. And when you're at the parts per billion level. And so for kale, what if kale is actually particularly good at taking up anti-nutrients or forever chemicals versus that rice? Would you still define it as being nutrient dense? Or would it actually be creating a, a toxin load that your body has to deal with that might bioaccumulate over time? Would you still con consider it to be nutrient dense? And so there's even further beyond what you and I have been talking about for years to go with the rest of the scientific literature and uncovering of what food and nutrition actually mean in relation to the soil that it's grown in, because of course the soil that it's grown in with arsenic or heavy metals or what have you, PFOS contamination, all of those things are just starting to come into view on what they mean for the food that's grown in them. And so I would argue there's an, an additional dimension or two here that we're gonna need to understand. And just building on that real quick, allergens. Um, some of the producers that I have spoken with who have done nutrient density testing on two different ingredients that are part of the top nine allergen set, two completely different fields of work, two completely different ge geographies, completely different crop types, both have said when they tested their product for allergenic compounds, and these are top nine allergens, they found none. Now, that is an earth shattering moment for the food system. If the allergenic compounds of the food system have actually been tied to the soil health and conventional production systems, the, just think about the implications. And well, so- some exactly. of this is about understanding those other outcomes in food production systems that matter for things like anaphylactic shock. We haven't even begun to talk about that as a system or to look at what type of science or representative testing would need to occur in order for parents of allergenic kids to understand what it means to go to a grocery store and make a choice of regenerative products based on whether or not it had anaphylactic properties. So I would say it's nutrient density in the way that you're talking about it for the future, but then there's so many other layers that we can put onto that that are fascinating and worthwhile to look into. 
Well, I think we certainly attempted to do that. I think we did in the beef project um, look not only at, at pro-nutrients, but anti-nutrients, you know, inflammation markers and stress hormones and, right. and, and, you know, other kinds of, you know, microbiome for dysbiosis um, in the, in the animals. So I think, you know, I would say that the way we've been <clears throat> working to define nutrient density in, in beef and as we're envisioning doing it going forward in other crops does look at that sort of, you know, I was not tens of thousands of compounds, but at least hundreds, hundreds of compounds and, and not all pronutrients, some anti-nutrients. And, you know, the, as you well know, our sort of vision about being able to assess quality, you know, nutrient density non-invasively with handheld instrumentation is an entirely different model than the one you're sort of explaining is that was the dominant current paradigm with the on, on pack side, side pack label, um, and you, you know, talked about how, especially with animal products, it's very difficult for companies to make claims about nutritional superiority or actually technically illegal, it sounds like, um, although they may be able to say some things on front of pack if it's not one of those key compounds. You said omega-3, omega-6. Um, <clears throat> we had some people here yesterday just talking about the sort of the deeper strategy and implications of this and, and walking through what it would be like for some larger companies in the animal proteins sector to, um, you know, if they were to really start to get much better omega-3 omega ratios, for instance, in their, in their you know, animal ingredients, how would they convey that and how, how easy would that be? How complex? And, um, you know, I think there's a, <clears throat> There's the framework you're presenting, which is, you know, go through the formal legal process, have it, you know, labeling and, and claims on pack. And the one we're proposing, which is much more of a bottom up, like let a bunch of people have meters and test and say, hey, oh, looks like this milk is almost always better than that milk. And um, let that be known through social media, but not even actually have it be a responsibility of the company to try to make those claims because of this difficulty. So using the using the community to assess these things and sort of give its blessing this brand generally has much better than that brand um as a way to get around this this whole labeling certification bureaucracy um process um yeah i just you know yeah again, there's several things in the, there the yeah, frame. There, there's um, several things in there dan um one would yeah. be like the formal process you just mentioned of what i've laid out following the food system that's just like with the regenerative movement where I said we have to raise the floor so the ceiling yep. can go, right? So that's yep. this is the foundational process to raise every to move the whole food system a leap forward in understanding what you're talking about and why it matters, right? In the for profit for profit packaged food system, what the collective regenerative community and nutrient density testing outcomes mean for the food system and how they can be enacted. Um what you mentioned, I'm so glad you brought up the beef project because I had meant to mention that when I was talking about animal proteins and the barrier, because this is where the work that the Nutrient Density Alliance is doing as a pre-competitive nonprofit effort to move those barriers or um, apply industry information in order to get regulatory guidance from the USDA and what this looks like going forward. Now, of course, it's no secret we're in an election year. It's a difficult time to go to USDA with an ask when people don't even know if they're going to be the ones in the roles. What it does require, though, is standardized data showing that those outcomes are actually measurable, quantifiable, tied to agricultural production services, and that there's an economic benefit for the companies to sell them and for um, uh, consumers to access them. And so what the data that you're creating with the Beef Project um, study does is allow the broader consortium of, you know, laboratories, you know, Eric Smith and Edacious, and we've talked, he and I have talked about this at length, on the regulatory barriers that we all as a consortium need to go to the USDA and say, here's how this is stymieing investment in this. You know, USDA has a soil health program, they're paying for um, conservation agriculture and conversion, they're moving towards more regenerative practices, if you will. I would think they'd have a vested interest in wanting to see producers be rewarded for those systems, similar to how organic producers are rewarded, not because we're looking to sh steal shelf space from the organic sector, but because the floor of the conventional system needs to be raised in a way that's actually better for national security, human health, farmer profitability, et cetera. And this is one of the elements of how we actually change the system for the better by allowing true consumer 
market-driven demand to be passed through the system for those producers that actually have those higher nutrition outcomes. So the data that you're creating and that others are creating in this space, especially on animal proteins, has a home in helping drive that decision-making at the USDA process about how just how measurable this is and what it means, especially when there's large producers and companies at the table, like I know are at the table for the beef study and that are at the table um, you know, on other fronts for uh, the Nutrient Density Alliance and in ways that we've kind of cut across the sector. We have um, beef providers, we have egg and poultry providers, we have um, uh, pork providers, um, you know, and so, and then there's the organic sector writ large has a vested interest in being able to show that the nutritional outcomes of organic foods in animal proteins are actually more beneficial than conventional, right? So that sector has a vested interest in this work as well. And so it's not just raising the ceiling for, or, or raising the floor for one part of the industry. It's actually raising the floor for the entire industry, including the organic sector and being able to make meaningful claims they haven't been able to make before about those nutritional outcomes from organic pastured animals that are required to be on pasture, minimum of 120 days or more a year, required to have access to the outdoors, et cetera. So that's where my mind goes when you talk about a beef study and you know the process and how we actually ensure that the data you're creating pulls through to something that in the future, those big companies that are at your table can put it somewhere other than just the front of pack claim that can be made around it's omega-3-6 fatty acid ratio, polyphenols and antioxidants. Those are the typical front of pack claims, but none of the side panel stuff. Um, and it's because there are scientific claims related to health, which is why those are governed by the Food and Drug Administration, not the USDA that governs side panel labeling. So just to call out that clarification again. Right. So, but, but, so I, I mean, I, I think I hear what you're saying, which is good that we're working to build this data set, which is showing that these things are connected, that these variations exist, yeah. that it connects to soil health, you know, better. Yeah human health outcomes we, we presume but <clears throat> but then i think what you said was um we would take that to the usda and they would have an interest in changing their their um regulatory framework by which these things can be conveyed what, what, what tell us what's in your you know your vision of what's possible how <clears throat> how does that look? what what is possible in two years or five years or ten years in relationship with the USDA and changing the formal structure of how things are, of how nutritional data is conveyed on package. I'm, I must admit, you know, quite cynical about the capacity of the USDA jumping to such a holistic way of communicating, which is why I've been focusing on the meter as a, as a, what I think is a more pragmatic strategy, but, um, you know, I'd love to hear your thoughts because you obviously are, are deeply involved in this. How, is there a model? How do you how do you see that? How do you see that happening? That we go yeah. from to a, to a much more holistic, formal so process. It needs to be a consortium effect. And what we're doing is talking with the large companies that have the legal and regulatory advisors, the expertise that are saying that under the current regulatory guidance, you can't do this. Yeah. But have the data because of the brands they own or because they're working with someone like BFA to show that there is actually an outcome that's meaningful. And so what I have found over the course of the last, I don't know, six to eight years that I've been working somewhat in the policy realm is that policy tends to follow my case, not the reversal, right? And so the confluence of events around food as medicine related to the insurance industry and lower costs related to um, military recruitment and only 20% adults being able to even pass the basic minimum of military requirements because of ill diet, right? Like there's just a confluence of reasons why the USDA might be interested in this, including matters of national security. So um, when you show them that the economic case is there along with the scientific case, that's when you have the ability to ask for their regulatory review. Here's what's true. If we never do this work, that will not change. Yeah. So we've got to start now. The other thing I'm looking at is the molecular mapping of food that we've talked about and all these other biochemicals that are coming into food. They can see that wave coming. The National Institute of Health and a couple of other government agencies have looked into personalized nutrition and this molecular mapping of food and what it's going to mean for the future. And that basis of science is how the rest of the regulatory agencies end up having the permissibility to treat these topics as real and actually look at what it means for how they regulate. 
Um, maybe it's setting it up for not this farm bill, but the following farm bill, right? For the USDA to undertake a specific study that shows that these outcomes are true or to pass regulatory guidance at that point that says that, um, you know, brands can now uh, do meaningful differentiation if they have representative sampling programs. They are unlikely to do so this year because of the, um, you know, political environment we're in because of the uh, election. However, the multi-consortium effect of all these different sectors that span animal agriculture, combined with the fact that we're about to turn this massive page on the science to have answers to questions we didn't even know to ask, I think does open the door to a scientific and political curiosity about updating the fact that agricultural systems have different nutritional outcomes. And maybe we should just start labeling that as a precursor for what is about to come next, because otherwise it is all going to be phone scanning and wearables. And where does the government regulations even land within that if, if you become irrelevant to the process? I don't think they wanna be ultimately irrelevant to the process. So I think to keep pace with some of what's coming, they are going to need to go here. And um, we have a lot of goodwill, I would say, um, from the players that are at our table. And I think you also do at yours and then Edacious does at theirs. Yeah. To be able to show that this is a wide swath of the conventional food system that also has regenerative components that would like to see this occur because there's good dollars and cents to be um, made from it as well. And so it's building that business case and then taking the consortium effect, having the right legal guidance and making sure that we're um, following the basic regulatory process that the USDA would need in order to undertake this type of review. And if we don't ask, it'll never happen. So we've got to ask. Yeah. Well, I, I, I to fully agree with you that engaging the process is a good thing to do. Um, I just, you know, <laughs> talk about hurting sheep. Uh, <laughs> well, I mean, you, I mean, I think you know, you made a very good point. So the health insurance industry, you know, I I would think has has a very strong incentive for people to be healthier. Um, I agree. And you know, we could even argue that the social security <laughs> agency would have a <clears throat> much much less the Department of Defense and everything else have strong incentives for this to happen. I'm just. Uh, the level of of bureaucratic, you know, coordination between governmental agencies and in industries from you know from different sectors, I think, is certainly a. I mean, if anybody can do it, bring it on. That would be <laughs> brilliant, brilliant organizing. Um, yeah, boy. Um, okay. Well, I think you know. I mean, that's. Um, yeah, is, is that would you say that's what Nutrient Density Alliance that's is? That's one of the things we're undertaking next. Yeah. Focus on it and take a take yeah. leadership role in. So yes, because we know if yeah. we don't at least answer that question or go through the process, that we've really only left ourselves nuts, seeds, fruits, and grains to work with. Right? Through the governmental framework. Yes. And Which that's not enough of the food system, especially when animals are so integral to actually regenerating land and returning the living life of the soil. Yeah. That's why this, the conversation has to happen. And so what I should mention for your audience at this point is I actually, you know, well, I, I helped found the Nutrient Density Alliance in early 2022 and spent the last two years working on it, two plus years. I'm not a registered dietitian. Um, I have an MBA. I was looking at the business case, the process, the consumer interest, what the landscape was, where the interested players were, how policy played within it. Um, what I've recently done is step back into the role of senior advisor so I can still speak on behalf of, you know, what we're doing as a, a community. Um, but I was successfully able to recruit uh, Mary Purdy, who is a registered dietitian with a scientific background, to backfill me as the managing director of the Nutrient Density Alliance, and she began that role just two months ago. And so now we also have the right scientific um, clout and process understanding for how companies make their intra-company decisions on even making claims, um, which was something where I could talk about the process, but I couldn't actually provide any advice about, well, it's this claim, right? Um, it was, here's the process you should go through to determine if you have a claim. Um, here's the process that might be keeping you from making that claim, um, but not some of the more nuanced understanding that actually exists within that field of research. And so um, I'm delighted that we've since expanded our uh, expertise with Mary coming on as the managing director and are looking at some of the broader efforts that are um, occurring around global food and, excuse me, global food and nutrition data, um, you know, but also maybe some of the work uh, like the periodic table of food initiative 
and other efforts, how that data actually gets bolted onto the for-profit food system, right? Because if it just exists in an academic lens and isn't actually bolted onto the food system, has it gone as far as it could? Yeah. Um, so how do we start to set the foundation and the framework so that the, that confluence of science that you're part of creating ends up leading to meaningfully different metrics within the food system that consumers can access? And every single one of us is pulling our weight and with different parts of the system in ways that matter um, toward what I hope is and I think is a shared vision of where um, land regeneration tied to consumer demand that helps keep farmers at that table in meaningful ways can matter for climate change mitigation. That's at least why I started and continue to do this work. Beautiful, beautiful. Well, we've used up our half hour of, of sort of personal <laughs> and uh, and uh, panel panel engagement. Now we've got a, a bunch of questions in the in the Q and A box for the last for the last half hour. Um, I've just been glancing over them. I'm happy to read out a couple that stick out to me and you can answer them or, sure. yeah or, let me know where you want to start for sure well yeah i mean this we'd like to engage the engage the attendees with with what they put in the q a box so it's uh what i wanted to start with what we just did this is this is there <laughs> is there anybody else who's still who wants to wants to put things in we we got half an hour here um um sherry sherry has the flavor remedy i'm not sure if you know sherry uh she's always always talking about about flavor which i think is a Concomitant. It's it's you know it's one facet of nutrient density as far as I'm concerned. It's we talk a lot about the science, but the the meter that we God gave us was our nose and our tongue, and uh, so I think that's a really important piece to not forget. She's got a, a a bit of a long question here. She says, "Hi Tina, as you know, my work focuses on that number one requirement for, for consumers: taste, taste and flavor. As we know, are not indicated on nutrition." nutrition panel, but those of us that follow nutrient density as it applies to ag practices are having the conversation that it tastes better. Um, since flavor and taste aren't regulated on nutrition panels and limited by the USDA, how do you believe we can elevate this opportunity to talk about taste as it applies to nutrient density outside of the USDA? I know there is science that can be applied to taste receptors and biochemistry. Um, how do you believe we can bring this conversation forward for consumers? Yes. So Sherry, uh, <laughs> thank you for the question. Also, Sherry is awesome. If anyone's interested oh, in understanding taste as a consumer driver, uh, she is the woman to talk to. Um, so taste is subjective. And it's one of the reasons we actually, I mean, we, we share that it's part of the consumer purchase intention, but that when it came to the science of nutrition tied to taste, outside of the work that BFA has done, there is not a lot of meaningful research, Dan, I have to say. It's quite yeah. lacking. Furthermore, since the food system considers this to be subjective, the way that they typically uncover that is to pay for consumer testing. So they'll test their old uh, formula versus their new, and then you'll see new and improved, right? Um, or versus the industry, you know, you might have all the all the chocolate bars lined up and ours, you know, had the best taste according to, you know, eight out of 10 samplers or what have you. And so a lot of those uh, topics that brands use to engage you on why and how they taste better have actually been through some sort of, um, you know, quantitative or qualitative research. And it's no different for the regenerative ag programs um, with nutrient density outcomes. And in fact, it is my firm belief that for marketers, until they actually see it in the consumer data, that that higher nutrition outcomes give them better taste versus their competitors, that's actually when they're going to get hooked on the fact that this is what to do for their brand because they know that that is subjective, taste is subjective. And as you stated, we each have our own receptors that are built to understand that that strawberry that tastes like cardboard is actually lacking in nutrition. Um, but we have not given voice to the fact that a lack of nutrients actually leads to a lack of taste. And, and I think it's one of the places where you've moved the needle um, you know, more than anyone else within the industry. Uh, from what I'm aware of. And then Sherry, of course, is working with brands individually and how they define it. So um, it is outside of the USDA process. It is still an on-pack claim that might require some substantiation from brands, especially if they're comparing themselves to industry norms or to competitors. They actually do have to go through a process where they prove that. Um, but there are industry standards around how you actually do that quantification and a whole bunch of businesses that um, lend themselves to that. But Sherry is uniquely qualified in understanding that that's also tied to agricultural production systems, which gives me a warm space in my heart for her. So yeah. um, let's move on to the next question. Well, just uh, and one one just follow up if I, if I may. Um, 
it, it seems like a lot of what you're talking about with flavor and the taste in your response was with products that are, you know, processed that have a, a number of ingredients that maybe yeah, all products part of yeah. that is flavoring agents, yes. which may be synthetic. So that I would, I mean, yeah, it's, it, it gets really sticky really fast because our taste receptors are tricked in many cases by those things that are put into products. Um, I think what she's talking about is the inherent flavor of a thing. And I'll just recount one sort of conversation I had with somebody from industry a number of years ago now. I think he was the he was the um, regional buyer for, for the North Atlantic region of Whole Foods. And he was telling me that um, when, when, you know, trucks full of pears or peaches or apples or whatever are coming over from from the west coast <clears throat> they will have before the truck leaves the west coast they'll have they'll have they'll know what the bricks reading is of those crops and when they find um crops that have a particularly high bricks reading they would they would make a space <clears throat> right at the front of the door right, right 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 when you walk in for those pears or those peaches or whatever they put them on sale um the ones that have the highest bricks reading they'll put them on sale right 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 in front and that's the you know those that's the fruit that people buy that week and when they go home and they eat it and they have this flavor experience unconsciously as an animal they're like oh my god i want more of that and so whole foods said they had done the research to show that they get better you know return traffic when they have the best flavor thing they can find for sale right when you walk in because mm -hmm. unconsciously we go back wanting more and yeah. we're looking for it i had it once i want to get it again just like a you know a sheep or a cow <laughs> working yeah. through the working through the uh the, the well, field I, I find myself doing that with expensive organic produce right if i eat something it doesn't taste good i might actually not buy it again for a few weeks yeah right or i might not buy it again that season so i think yeah there's definitely it's... something there yeah yeah there's definitely something there all right yeah. which question shall we go after for next um Okay, uh, Doug, Tina, great presentation. With your experience at Kellogg's, to what degree do you see what's available for consumers impacted by large food service corporations, rebate, volume, discount, buying programs? How does this get changed? Yeah, so Doug, this is actually something I've recently been chewing on with other members of the industry, and in some cases specific to dairy, like grazed dairy that is not... Um, specific to uh, organic, for example. And so institutional demand is where I'm gonna go with your question. I'm just gonna say, you know, the, whether it's Veterans Affairs or the USDA school lunch program or food service, um, you know, large hospital organizations or um, even, you know, Aramark and um, Cisco and some of the distributors and, um, uh, you know, ways that we access food away from home. It definitely matters. And uh, they respond to price premiums. Companies like Kellogg's respond to price premiums that exist within those channels. So in the context of dairy, what we were talking about was what if the USDA actually created a definition of grass-fed milk that was separate from organic and offered a price premium to those producers and put it in the school lunch program um, because it had higher nutrition outcomes? Right. And there's institutional demand. It creates a safe place for farmers to convert to grazed uh, dairy without having to have a specific certification. You could do something called mass balance, where maybe 5% of your portfolio is through um, farmers that are offering grazed dairy. And it allows a safe place with offtake for farmers to transition. The other thing we were talking about was what if programs like SNAP and WIC? actually used something um, like the, the double up bucks uh, program that a lot of CSAs and state programs use where um, if you had SNAP or WIC and you went to a farmer's market, you got double bucks. So instead of $1, you got two. Uh, what if for a specific category of foods that are actually much better for your health um, through SNAP and WIC, when I went to the grocery store to Kroger and I bought something that's specifically in that category that's higher nutrient density, what if my dollar is actually $1.25 or $1.50, which would also remove some of the barriers on you know, organic food or maybe regenerative or higher nutrient density food being gated by a higher price point and would also incentivize people potentially to move away from some of those low nutrient density foods that they might otherwise purchase because um, it's easy consumption and a lot of calories. And so institutional demand very much matters for how companies design products, um, who they're targeted at for consumers and government 
organizations and other large buyers do have a role that they can play a bit easier um, in creating demand signals in that system that help farmers convert. So that may not feel like a satisfying answer, but it is the way the system works. I'd love to jujitsu it into um, some demand for <laughs> regenerative uh, yeah. products of any sort. So I'm currently struggling with that or, or working on that issue right now. I'll, I'll keep you posted. Wonderful. Wonderful. All right. So Chris uh, says um, uh, regarding the FAO and soil health and nutrient density, uh, and do you have any references um, on that can be shared showing anything from the FAO? And thank you for a very insightful presentation. That's very nice. Thank you. I do actually have a link um, to some of the aggregated information. Um, it's called uh, Soil for Nutrition State of the Art, and it's from the UN FAO. Um, let, and there's, there's actually three that I'd like to share real quick. Soil for Nutrition... Um, the other is Food Animal Concerns Trust, which um, is a nonprofit. I'm going to put this in the chat, not in the Q&A. Um, Food Animal Concerns Trust is a nonprofit that uh, aggregates the nutritional benefits of humane farming. So this would be animals that are pastured. And for consumers, they have these handouts on nutritional benefits, but they also on this page have a bibliography that is 24 pages of peer reviewed research specific to the health benefits of um, pastured and humanely raised animals. And um, they, it, it's just the, one of the more comprehensive resources that I've ever seen. The third one that I would like to share with you is from someone, an entity that Dan and I are both connected with. Um, it's the Regenerative Healthcare European Association. Dan, they were formerly called the a regenerative healthcare coalition. And they have a database, which I think also includes a bunch of uh, BFA work um, that is aggregated information on nutrient density, human health, soil health, et cetera. So yeah. um, those are the three that I typically go to. If you wanna see a whole bunch of different resources at once and be able to kind of parse through what's useful for your own um, you know, research interests and outcomes. Um, if anybody knows of any other aggregated information, uh, BFA obviously has their um, their deep reports as well, but uh, feel free to bring them to our attention. I'm always on the lookout for good resources. Great. So thank you for the question, Chris. Yeah, great question. And I think Raisa is on today from the region of health. It wouldn't Online. surprise me. Yeah. And if so, yeah. hi, Raisa. <laughs> yeah, pretty sure she's here. Um, <clears throat> um, Mandy asks, can you please put the QR code up one more time? I think for the- I saw the that, yes. Let me get that up real quick. All right, get your cameras ready. You can also go to nutrientdensityalliance.org and click on up in the upper right-hand corner is a link to white paper. Um, and you do uh, need to put your name and your email in, but it'll immediately take you to the white paper itself. Um, and so uh, feel free to look through it and ask tough questions. We'd love to hear from you. And so, um, why don't we read the next question and then I'll take this slide down just so everybody's got a minute. Right. Where do you want to go next, yep. Dan? Uh, well, Sue's got a couple of questions here. I think um, the second one I'll just read first. Uh, um, the use of regenerative organic and organic, does one imply that organic is not regenerative? And why have we coupled the words together? Is this language that is bridging the two but not making a lot of sense? Um, I think you touched on that, but just to sort of... I did. Yeah. And we, yeah, we so... We, the and I'm going to a website right now. Um, there's there is an organic is regenerative approach from OFRF and some other stakeholders in the organic sector. Let me just put this in the chat. And so, if you want to hear from the organic sector what their case is for why organic is regenerative, um, there's a toolkit and you can see that link that's actually at that what I just put in the chat. So, that would be a good place to go to understand this in more detail. Um, but Where I think some, some, yeah, some of the fault lines are on this is that organic has two issues that undercut the potential of, for that to be a blanket statement across all organic. One is hydroponics and uh, growing organic that's not in soil. The second is the use of tillage um, within organic as weed suppression uh, versus the use of herbicides, which has been a longstanding tool within the organic sector, but which disrupts the soil microbiome in a way 
um, that um, disrupts soil organic matter and potentially leads to less nutrition uptake. And I, I think it's why, Dan, you and I, you know, um, had some conversations with Greg Shoemaker uh, of Teak Origin and the, the research they were doing on nutrient density outcomes. And, you know, he was saying 70% of the time they found that organic was more nutritious, but not always. And that likely that was actually tied to the tillage factor. And so, uh, again, I think the organic sector is doing this because they're focused on how the focus on the farm has actually been a towering strength for organic. I worry about those two caveats. Here is the actual true strength of the organic sector. And I've chastised a couple of them recently about remembering to include this because everybody has forgotten it. Um, and I will bring up a website with the proof and put it in the chat. Um, the outcome of organic is that there are, um, let's see here, there are 900 less chemicals used in agricultural production in the field. There are over 500 less animal medicinal and antibiotic compounds used in animal production agriculture. And there are over 3,000 less chemicals used in actual food production, things like BHT, which is a um, preservative in your cereal liners, which is also used in embalming, by the way. Um, bisphenol A, you know, everybody remember BPA free water bottles, and they just switched to something that was like BP, you know, bisphenol B or something so that they could say it was bisphenol A free. Um, organic doesn't have any of those things. There's no bisphenol A lining your soup cans. There's no artificial colors and flavors. And so I do worry a bit about the organic sector being a bit myopic and trying to have a soil fight with the regenerative community. When actually everything I just mentioned, the 3000 food production chemicals, the 900 agricultural chemicals and the 500 um, medicinal and antibiotic uses in animal production, those are regulated by law. The organic sector is the only sector in the US that automatically excludes every single one of those issues. And it matters. So I get a little frustrated at this organic is regenerative because I feel like it's about shelf space when actually there's a much stronger play for organic that everybody needs to be reminded of, which is that it excludes um, these anti-nutrients, if you will, or the other things you would not want bioaccumulating in your food system or yeah. in your soil. <clears throat> Brilliant. Brilliant. Um, the first half of Sue's question, um, thank you for this deep dive into your work and for sharing the white paper, which shines a light on how to move this huge regen ship into becoming mainstream. I agree that using the same systems and processes where practical makes a lot of sense. But the steps can appear extremely daunting and make me wonder if we have the time to follow all these processes or whether we could slash should dare to seek out quicker routes. Should we be mapping against what has failed or designing totally new systems and processes? I think I was driving at that point, and I think you said, you know, at least let's go for it. But I, yeah, I, I certainly share that 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 um, that impulse. So, do anything further you want to say about that, or just? Uh... Yeah, I would say dogma breaking in this moment, especially in something that's a century old conversation, is been is critically important. But yet, there is no political will to throw out everything that we have now and start over but to change it incrementally. And yeah. so we've got to be um, very tenacious and very pragmatic um, users in the system, pushers in the system of where it needs to go in order to highlight the changes, the differences in the food system that already exist, right? None of this stuff is true because it ended up on a package. All of this stuff is true because it is true, whether or not it's on a package. Mm -hmm. Eating that strawberry that tastes better is true whether or not it was on the package telling you that it had higher nutrition. You eating that chicken that has 30% higher nutrition is true whether or not the label actually tells you that or not. And so it's about having the way that we, um, the way that we package food actually catch up to the actual state of what the science now knows how to measure, demonstrably show, and knows matters for human health. And that takes time. So um, we'll keep working on it. I know there's a lot of us that would love to just scrap some things and start over, not politically viable. So we'll work with what we have. Yeah, it's a bit of a bit of a rock and a hard place, but yes, it, forward motion is all we can all we can do, and, and you never know what'll 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 come through the grace of God or or however. So yeah, yeah. but if we don't try to change it, it will never change. And so exactly. incremental change or even holding a line is just as important as big wins. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
Well, and I, I would say, you know, you work on that side and I'll work on the meter side and maybe we can meet in the middle and, you know, let them <laughs> let them yeah. facilitate <laughs> the the, the, uh, the political pressure. And, and uh, yeah, sometimes the inside outside. I think that's when I did politics 20 years ago. That was we were always talking about the inside and outside strategy and they could be potentially synergistic. Yeah. Beautiful. Um, all right. Uh, Claire asks, uh, can this process be used for fresh or food that doesn't get refined in any way? Exact example, fruits and vegetables. Or is it based on food that has protein? Um, yeah, again, you know, a lot of what you've been talking about is food that is processed to some degree and then packaged with labels and um, yeah, so. And it can be, it does. So I used protein as a very reductionist and singular example that had a, you know, that I was able to follow all the way through. But yeah. yes, food and fruit and veg. Um, produce does have the ability to have representative sampling. The issue there is um, how short the shelf life is and whether or not a producer would take the time to do the representative sampling, have the lab test come back and have it be in time for them to actually put something on the package. And so that's where actually having multi-year uh, tests that show that you have a higher nutrient density could allow you to be able to plan ahead for the next season and do a little bit of comparative uh, sampling to show that you still have that outcome and then put it on pack. Um, yeah, this is the only, the only part of the food system that I know of at this point that has a barrier in actually doing representative sampling and putting it on pack is animal proteins. So, um, I, this has been true for produce so much as I've been told, and it's more about the time factor. Cool. All right. Chris asks, or, or says a lot of this uh, conversation has focused on the agricultural regulatory frameworks. Um, and food producers slash sellers, out of curiosity, is there any engagement or dialogue with healthcare providers, health insurance companies? Would they not also be potentially collaborative influencers? I mean, you you had a slide about the, the um, you know, uh, food as medicine work that's happening. Um, I've certainly been to some conferences at Tufts where it, really the life insurance was actually remarkably there. <laughs> they, were, they were like, oh, people are dying younger, not, not, not in our best interest. But yeah, what, what, what do you think about that? And the, yeah, you need to talk about uh, it a little bit. There is a ton of overlap here. The issue is that, Chris, is that um, those that are funding getting carrots on plates and feeding people and those that are funding soil health and regenerative agriculture for climate perspectives, even if it's in some cases the fam same family offices, are not understanding yet the link between the two and that just getting carrots on plates is not enough. And as Dan is fond of saying, a carrot is a carrot is a carrot, um, they might have to eat 10 of those carrots to get the same nutrition that's in one. And so I do think as the science unfolds, this, this also goes to USDA being willing to put it on package or brands being willing to do the testing on the carrot, for example. Um, to show that this is real for funders, because funders look at what they can see in the grocery store. Um, food distribution programs look at what they can see on the side panel. Uh, so the hypothesis of what Dan and I are working with and know has been proven from an academic and scientific perspective, that translation into the actual food system matters, not just for what you see and can purchase in a cereal box, but actually how it gets distributed um, you know, across other systems. And so people can't source what they don't think is real. I also think the bigger play here is medically tailored meals. Currently, Dan, there's no requirement on medically tailored meals for which agricultural production system they're sourced from. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh yeah. my, if you're going to do that level of scientific and rigor research and, and actually track the metrics of health coming out from that. And so Aaron Meyer, who I know we both know and Basil's Harvest, you know, they're working with some of the medically tailored meal providers and she's at the University of Illinois and they're trying to answer that question. Um, and they're also, you know, doing some work with a couple of the, um, you know, military agencies to, to show them what it means for food distribution and, um, you know, mass demand on regenerative products uh, through those other systems as it relates to, you know, human health outcomes. So it's just uncharted territory. All of this has to be bolted on to those, those food systems yeah. in ways that matter. Yeah. And it, and it sure looks like there are dramatic economic incentives, but you never really know how these large entities are actually structured. But I mean, I've certainly met people in all these institutions, big food companies, you know, insurance, governmental agencies, uh, you know, researchers across the board that are all, I mean, some people like to say, oh, that's this person who works for that company, they must be a bad person. But my experience is in all these entities are very good people who totally mean well. And, yeah. but there is a, a an immense amount of bureaucratic inertia and, 
and stricture, which does make it quite difficult. Yeah. Um, and frankly, if we don't yeah. work with big to be good, we, we can't allow big to be bad because the, the small stuff the rest of us might do won't matter in the grand scheme of broader systems change and climate change if we don't get big to be good. And so there are always change makers in those large institutions and they need our support. Yeah. Um, hey, can I take Dinah's question real quick? Please. On the 1% I've been of land. Well, so Dinah I've asked, one percent of land is currently under organic. Is that because ninety percent of the U.S. are under conventional production, like corn, soy, cotton, and wheat? Seems like a strong argument to focus on clean wheat as a strategy to help both nutrition and environmental toxicity. The one percent of land under organic um, management is actually because we failed, uh, from a policy perspective, to provide um, transition assistance. And so, um, and in many ways, because we didn't shore up our domestic production of organic, it allowed the international markets to come in potentially at a price point that U.S. farmers couldn't even meet. And so that actually happened a lot on produce, where um, produce brought in from lower cost of labor and um, lower cost of living from other countries set a price floor that was so low that even the U.S. Uh, producers of organic um, produce in the U.S. had trouble even staying in business when that occurred. And it kind of flew the, blew the whole system into flux. Uh, for grains, most, almost all of the organic grains, um, especially those that are imported, are actually going into animal feed. So it's the chicken, it's the pork, it's the beef, it's the organic dairy supplementation. Um, and so a lot of the organic products that you're eating um, that aren't just straight up grain are likely to come from overseas somewhere based on the price point that organic has and the fact that it might be cheaper to ship it here than grow it here. Um, that matters fundamentally for food miles and the greenhouse gas emissions of the organic sector altogether, which I could talk an hour about, so I'll leave it there. Um, <laughs> but it, it's actually about a kind of a, a misstep on what we provided in transition assistance for producers wanting to move to organic, but not feeling like they could uh, go through all the process of segregation and investment they had to do um, and the global supply chain being able to get it cheaper from elsewhere. Dan, where do you want to go next? I was going to say, are there any more that you've, you you see that you'd like to answer? I've been I, I'm proposing them all. You got, you got three minutes left. So uh, any, any you've seen that you want to jump on? Oh boy. Um, da, 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 da. Let's see. What we, there's still several left. I apologize, folks. It's okay. um, let's go with, has any other country or federation come up with a definition or a standard for what is regenerative agriculture? Um, currently, the state of California is trying to come up with a standard definition for regenerative agriculture. That will matter for the U.S. because um, it will help seed uh, what the future of policy is for uh, regenerative ag. The U.S. is actually the, the center of the regenerative movement. Um in leading the conversation in many ways on implementation at the farm level. There's a lot of countries, and I'm not saying this out of ignorance or some sort of American pride. I'm saying this because um, I spent a lot of time talking with other regenerative practitioners around the world and have been told repeatedly, and I see Dan shaking his head as well, yeah. that when it comes to couching this as regenerative agriculture, the US is the one that is essentially in the driver's seat on that conversation. So um, it matters if the state of California defines it. It matters uh, what all the different certification bodies use to define it. But what I want to remind people of is that prior to the National Organic Program being passed in 1990 and the USDA creating, creating the organic program in the U.S., more than 25 states had their own individual definition of organic. Yep. And they had all different percentages and, and a little bit different on what was allowed and wasn't allowed and blah, blah, blah. And this is how a movement of any meaningful size gets started, is that there is a ton of voices that leads to a confluence of outcomes that at some point coalesces into standard understanding of the space. And we are currently in that process where it's moved out of the fringe and more of the values-based space and into the conventional space if 68 of the top 100 food companies say they have something unregenerative. And so um, we're in that uh, space of the storming, norming, forming, you know, et cetera. Um, and this is all to be desired because it means that the conversation is relevant enough that every single part of the system is wrestling with it because it has value for every single part of the system. So please don't ever let the fact that there's a whole bunch of definitions or a whole bunch of voices or regulations or not 
stop you from thinking that there is not something of value here. It's because it's so valuable to every part of the sector that the conversation is so robust. And I would ask you to embrace it. It's part of how you change systems. So for those that want to scrap the old, start over with the new, sorry, you got to go through this process. It isn't fun. It's why we choose our battles wisely, right? It's why the whole sector is tussling with this. Um, so yeah. with that, Dan, I'll pass it to you for to, to close us out. Well, I would just say, I mean, I, I agree with you entirely. Um, there is no uniform definition because it's an iterative, evolving, you know, living process. And, and who would be the one person or organization who would have the prerogative to do that? I think the, the exact point that you made is that it should be a, a thing where it bubbles up and we you know, certain people get this piece right and certain people get that piece right and we learn from each other and we evolve and iterate. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, I did, I was just talking to Cindy Daly, uh, who's at, you know, at Chico State in California a couple of days ago. And apparently she's part of this project working on the certification for uh, the California state definition of regenerative. And she was um, speaking quite positively about how she thought it was being done she was she felt really good about it. it's it's um integrity and thoughtfulness and things yeah. so, and the uh, reason that's important by the way is because chico state was the first one to come up with a mainstream definition on february 16th of 2017 which i just put in the chat so if you want to see where we started where the conversation's been all along it's right there the first the first university to ever we did in a bag department on the planet i think um i, I mean think so. they, yeah they were quite 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 on the front cutting edge there so okay. yeah well this has Thank been a wonderful you, conversation. Thank you very much. And it looks like we're getting a bunch of appreciations in the in the chat. People uh, appreciated the uh, the uh, conversation. So thank you. Thank you, Tina. This has been great. All right. Thank you, Dan. It's been a pleasure. I really appreciate um, connecting with you in the community today. So thank you for hosting me and having this conversation. It's much appreciated. All right. Yeah. All right. Thank you all. Bye-bye.